Uh, so now we're lucky enough to wrap up this keynote section of our event with another superstar scientist. Uh, he is professor of physics of the oceans at the University of Potsdam, and he heads the Earth System Analysis Department um, at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research on Germany. He served on the German government's uh, Scientific Advisory Council on Global Change, and he has published over 140 scientific studies and received multiple awards for his influential work. So please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage, Professor Stefan Ramstoff. Yeah, hello everyone. It's uh, fantastic to be here in Helsinki. I've just been for three days at the Nordic Tipping Week workshop discussing uh, tipping points, including the AMOC. And uh, that is my talk today here. I want to start with this image, though, which shows you how the carbon dioxide level and the global temperature have evolved over the last 2,024 years since the birth of Christ. CO2, we know accurately, global temperature, of course, it's not enough to measure at one point. You have to have uh, sediment cores, ice cores spread around the world. So there's an uncertainty range there, but I think the picture is very clear. Uh, we are in a warming that is unprecedented in thousands of years, extremely rapid, and we must stop it as soon as possible. So what is this Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC for short? It is what uh, Jim called uh, North Atlantic Deepwater Circulation. That is indeed the deep branch of it. Uh, on the right, you see in red the surface branch of the AMOC. It's a northward flow of relatively warm water, which then gives off its heat to the atmosphere in the North Atlantic. It uh, brings an amount of heat there which corresponds to 50 times the global energy used by humanity. And that is released to the atmosphere to the west of Europe. And that water then becomes dense enough to sink because cold water is denser and uh, returns between two and 3,000 meters as this North Atlantic deep water flow. It is often confused with the Gulf Stream. Here is a nice, uh, the, the first image of the Gulf Stream by Benjamin Franklin in 1769. Um, but it's not the same as the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is mostly a wind-driven phenomenon. That wind-driven part doesn't transport very much heat because that water then returns on the eastern side of the uh, Atlantic at a similar temperature as it has moved north. That doesn't leave much heat behind. The AMOC functions like a central heating system, warm water flowing towards the north, cold water back. Um, so that leaves a lot of heat in the North Atlantic. And in the background, uh, you see uh, this kind of picture. These are measurements. This is the trend in uh, the satellite sea surface temperature data. And it shows several things. It shows this famous cold blob that is the only part of the globe that has cooled since the 19th century, while the entire rest of the planet has warmed. But it also shows this peculiar warming along the American coast, and that happens to be also a symptom of a slowing of the AMOC, like that cold blob is. The AMOC brings less heat into that region, that's why there's a cold blob, but a slowing of the AMOC also means that the Gulf Stream shifts north, and that shift is what you see in, uh, these, uh, in, in this excessive warming on the American coast. And then there's also this warming in the Nordic seas, which uh, we believe is also linked to a slowing AMOC, but I can't go into detail on that one. Now we study that with computer simulations like this one here from the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton. It's already quite old, but it is one of the early ones that shows a really nice high-resolution ocean. In red, you see the warm Gulf Stream waters, which uh, leaves the American coast at Cape Hatteras, starts to meander, um, but generally brings that warm water into the high latitudes, where it then cools down and gives off its heat. Now, with model simulations like that, we can experiment and test what happens um, if we 
slow down the AMOG or even shut down the AMOG. And uh, that is on the left-hand side. It's a very new model simulation where the AMOG has artificially been shut down just to see what the effects are. And the effect on sea surface temperature is shown in this diagram. And so you see this fingerprint pattern of an AMOG shutdown in this case. Uh, and compare that to the satellite data, uh, which are shown here in normalized way, so it's divided by the global mean sea surface temperature change, um, but that's a technical detail. You see the same thing, Gulf Stream shift, cold blob, in the AMOC collapse simulation as you see in the observation. So this is one of the key pieces of evidence that the AMOC is indeed slowing. Why do we need this? Because direct measurements only started in 2004. They also show a slowing, but the time period is kind of too short to be sure. Is this really due to global warming? Is it maybe natural fluctuations? And that's why it's so important to have longer term uh, information on what the AMOC is doing. And there are many other things like salinity fingerprints, etc., that also uh, point to the slowing of the AMOC is already ongoing. Here on the left, you see uh, that climate model that I showed earlier, not for an AMOC shutdown experiment, but that is an experiment of CO2 doubling, where the AMOC slows down. And again, you see that same fingerprint in the model. Uh, this is it in the ship-based sea surface temperature measurements since the 19th century. And uh, of course, because we haven't measured everywhere every year since the 19th century. That picture is fuzzy, it's, it's not sharp. There is some space-time averaging involved, but I think uh, you will agree that in the North Atlantic we have, we see that fingerprint pattern uh, already for this longer-term data. And um, here is the, the satellite data again that uh, you have already seen for the, since the beginning of satellite measurements. We can also look back further in time with uh, paleoclimatic data that come from sediments, deep sea sediments, ice cores, and uh, similar sources. And uh, different research groups have used very different methods for that and uh, published reconstructions of the AMOC strength, and that shows you the last more than 1,000 years. And uh, what these reconstructions have in common, that the AMOC is stable until uh, it's, uh, like 150 years ago or so, when it really then starts to go down. And that's the basis for that statement that is at its weakest now in at least a millennia. Now, the, the problem is we know the AMOC has a tipping point, not very new. It was first shown in 1961 by the famous American oceanographer Henry Stommel in a very simple bot, uh, box model, um, just a few equations. They have a quadratic solution, and you see if you add fresh water to the North Atlantic, like melting ice, etc., uh, then the AMOC weakens, but the curve bends back, and at this, what I call the Stommel bifurcation, you fall off the cliff. It becomes an irreversible shutdown of the AMOC. And that has been confirmed again and again in all kinds of models, uh, up to really high resolution, eddy resolving ocean circulation models like, like you saw in that animation. And if we look at the standard models by the IPCC for in the IPCC reports uh, for the strength of the AMOC, uh, that's what this diagram shows, then, I mean, what first of all, on the left you see the models have a large uncertainty when it comes to even how strong the AMOG is. That's because that is not an easy problem, like global temperature. It's a highly nonlinear, very sensitive system. So you have a model spread. Um, the real value is kind of in the middle there, but 17 Sverdrup is the observed one. Um, then you see how they bend down around about now or before now, before 2000, they start to go down. And you see the observed trend for that, those direct measurements we have since 2004. So that kind of agrees with the models, which would indicate that that trend is indeed a, a thing of global warming and not natural variability. And then uh, the AMOC shuts down here in the end. This is actually only those models where the AMOC does shut down. That's not all models. I will show you 
in a minute. Uh, if we take also the models that don't shut down, we can calculate what percentage shuts down and give a probability for a shutdown based on that. Um, but for, for the high emissions scenario, nine models have been continued beyond 2100 and in all nine the AMOC shuts down. So if we continue on a high emissions path, that is like almost certain that it will shut down the AMOC. Overall, if we, yeah, if we take all the models, there's more than 50, and look at the probabilities, which ones shut down, which ones uh, don't shut down the AMOC, then with high emissions, then 70% of them actually have a, a shutdown that includes those that haven't been continued beyond 2100, but where we conclude the AMOC is so weak that it basically is beyond the tipping point and would have shut down had these people continued their model simulations. Uh, for intermediate emissions, uh, we now have a 37% risk of shutdown, and even the low emissions is sticking to the Paris Agreement, uh, we still have a 25% chance of shutdown. And I, I have studied the AMOC stability question since 1991, almost 35 years now, and for 30 of those years, we have all in the community considered that a low probability but high impact risk probability less than 10%. I have always argued that is far too high. I mean, would you board a plane that has a 5% chance of crashing? Probably not. So um, I always argue we need to do something about this, even if the risk is only 5%. Now, that is the best probability estimate that we have. And um, I was shocked when I first saw those results. I'm a, I'm a co-author on that paper, but when I was first shown these model results, uh, I was really shocked and I have uh, just mentioned I have been at the Nordic Tipping Week and we have seen new results that mean that probably the real probabilities are higher because people have tested which of these many models look the most realistic compared to observational data and unfortunately the kind of good models, the most realistic ones, are the ones where the AMOC weakens most. And that's why uh, this is the probability across all models, whether good or bad, and if you just take the good models, even for immediate intermediate emission scenario, the probability of shutting down the AMOC is way above 50%. That is really depressing. I'm sorry about that. But the, the final really also very worrying point is where do we pass a tipping point? I mean, until the AMOC is fully shut down takes quite a while and until it spins down, but where is the tipping point where this becomes inevitable? And that is mainly when the deep mixing in these regions, Labrador Sea, Erminger Sea, Nordic Seas here stops if, if convection shuts down. Now these are time series in the models, two example models where convection breaks down. You see there it's around 2050, uh, even before 2050, um, that is where the tipping point is. So we will probably pass the point of no return for an AMOC shutdown in the next 10, 20 years or so. So that is why last year, um, 44 AMOC experts wrote an open letter to the Nordic Council of Ministers alerting them uh, to this risk, and uh, this is um, actually one reason why we had this Nordic Tipping Week uh, here, because the Council of Ministers has taken that uh, very seriously. And um, now, uh, just to, to come to my conclusions, many of the standard model runs show the AMOC is on the way to collapse. Um, the observational data support that. Tipping point is probably passed in the next few decades, the collapse risk can be reduced by lower emissions. It cannot be reduced to, to zero anymore, not even to less than 10%, but at least it can be reduced. And we simply have no time to lose if we want to prevent this massive risk to our future. And if you want to read more, I have uh, written a review article that is kind of for a general audience in the uh, Oceanography magazine, it's uh, free to read online. Thank you very much.